Hi, so it's time for Wednesday night story time, and we are now in for a treat. We are going to hear two really good stories. Um, one is never play music next to the zoo. So, um, and then the other one is called Brothers at Bat, and it's about a family that has 16 kids in it, and they have enough brothers to field a whole baseball team. So um, let's enjoy. Okay, so number play music right next to the zoo. Never play music right next to the zoo, illustrated by Lisa Hernandez. And it also is kind of cool because it also has some music. You can check it out. It's available through the Chronic Public Library in a kit. It's very cool. I went to a concert when I was a lad, no older than many of you. I sat with my sister, my mother, my dad, at a band shell right next to the zoo. You ever gone to the zoo for a music concert? And here's a bunch of people, and it says, free concert tonight. There's a snake on the lamppost. Kind of cool. The soft summer air was so balmy and sweet, and the program was running so long that I found myself falling asleep in my seat, despite all the music and song. There's the concert going with the animals. What's going to happen, do you think? All at once, the conductor erupted with rage. A band of wild animals was storming the stage. Oh no, there goes the music and elephants and raccoons. And there's, I see, goats and monkeys and oh my gosh, look at this. Oh children, remember, whatever you may do, never play music right next to the zoo. They'll burst from their cages each beast and each bird, desperate to play all the music they heard. Oh my gosh, that would be quite a dilemma. The lions and the elephants, the bears and the raccoons will steal away the trumpets, the flutes and bassoons. Oh, there she is, <laughs> fighting them off with her stand, music stand. Replace the musicians and chase them away. Oh no, <laughs> not a good place to stand in the tooth of a lion's mouth. Then they'll sit in the band shell and play. Oh my gosh, look at that elephant. The monkeys play fiddle. The bison plays bass. Percussions were manned by the camel. Oh my gosh. The yak play the sax until red in the face, a surprisingly musical mammal. Wow. <laughs> the bonobo played the oboe, the ferret the flute, the jackal attacked the bassoon. Oh my gosh, look at them. The hippo had chosen the tuba to toot by the light of the silvery moon. Siberian tigers, look at them. Mongolian goats, superabundance of bestial notes. Oh my gosh, <laughs> he's gonna eat her music. <laughs> oh my gosh, the pictures, all the animals. This is quite a deal. As the animal orchestra 
filled up the air with chaos, confusion, and clatter. The audience calmly continued to stare as if nothing at all was the matter. I'm just enjoying their music. <laughs> I trembled with terror, suppressing a scream, while my parents just sat there enraptured. Oh, how I wish it was only a dream and those creatures all safely recaptured. But since by the music, I'd grown less afraid. Oh my gosh, he's like he's having fun. I decided to sit back and watch while they played. There he is, and there they are. <laughs> wow, look at that orchestra. They finished, and each put his instrument down, then bowed and descended the sage. Each shed his tuxedo for evening gowns. There they go and hurry back home to his cage. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's quite a trick. Wow. Then each reminisced, so grateful and glad, so full of contentment and pride. My mother, meanwhile, strolled away with my dad, but my sister remained by my side. Why is his sister there? She tugged on my sweater and spoke in my ear. You'd better wake up or we're leaving you here. Oh, children, remember, whatever you may do, never play music right next to the zoo. They burst from their cages, each beast and each bird, desperate to play all the music they've heard. No, never play music right next to the zoo and pay strict attention to rule number two. Bear it in mind, for the rest of your days. What's rule number two, can you guess? Don't fall asleep when an orchestra plays. <laughs> okay, so, um, hope you enjoyed that story. So can you tell me um, what happened in the stories? And what do you think really happened? We went through it all, uh, all this thing, all this, he's talking about, um, he's going to the zoo and they're supposed to play some music. So um, he's there and check out this kit because it's pretty cool. The music actually is pretty fun too. Um, so he went to the zoo with his family his mom and dad and then what happened yeah he fell asleep and he's listening to the music and then something happens so tell me did he just dream that the animals took over and they went on stage did they he just dream that all this stuff happened or did it really happen can you tell me? So if you have an idea of whether or not all of this stuff really happened or if it's just his dream, make a comment in Facebook um, or um, tell me what part you liked. And I thought it was pretty, it was a pretty fun story. And so uh, apparently his parents didn't care. They were all pretty calm about it and he decided to just enjoy it all too so was it a dream or did he imagine it or does it matter 
if it's a dream? Did he ma does it matter if he imagined it? So anyway, hope you enjoyed that story. And um, it's by a um, really popular author, um, Lisa Hernan. It's illustrated by Lisa Hernan, but um, it's actually written by Litfield, John Lit Lithgow. Gow, Lithgow. He's pretty fun. He's got a number of his um, books. So, um, and then the other one is is about, I was really impressed, it's the spring and it's, you know, baseball um, coming up. So baseball, so it's Brothers at Bat. And this is a, based on a, an amazing all brother baseball team. So this is the picture. And again, it's um, among our collection. This is in the nonfiction collection, so it's a picture book. But um, it says, for the Aceras of the past, present, and future. So this is, um, the, that was the name of the brothers. Her. Uh, oh, these is really the more robust with uh, all their baseball equipment on top. When winter's chill melts into spring, back door swing open and slap shut as children just home from school run outside mitts bats and balls in hand so that's what they're doing all running outside in the spring in one new jersey town near the ocean back in the 1920s and 30s you could hear the same door slam over and over. Three brothers raced out. Slap, slap, slap. Out went three more. Slap, slap, slap. And more. Slap, slap, slap. And more. Still slap, slap, slap. So this is all these boys. It sounds like a fairy tale. 12 baseball playing brothers, but Anthony, Joe, Paul, Alfred, Charlie, Jimmy, Bobby, Billy, Freddy, Eddie, Bobby, and Louie and Sarah were real. They had four sisters too, Catherine, Florence, Rosina, and Francis, and a white dog named Pitch. <laughs> The sisters didn't play ball. Back then, most boy people thought sports were just for boys. Oh, okay. Interesting point of view. So, anyway. The Sarahs had so many kids that they slept two to a bed and sat three across in their outdoor bathroom. Oh my gosh, this is the 20s and 30s. They ate dinner wherever they could find a seat. Even on a baseball field, there were more boys than positions. But that didn't stop them from playing. So there they all are. Baseball set the rhythm of their lives. Every spring, Freddie said, you would take your glove out, go in the yard, and play. Neighbors couldn't recall a time when there weren't the Sarah boys outside, tossing the ball, hitting it hard, racing around with the young ones, watching, wishing they were old enough to play. Their high school baseball team had an Acera on it 22 years in a row. <laughs> oh my gosh. Nineteen thirty-eight, the boys ranged in age from seven to thirty-two. 
the oldest nine formed their own semi-pro team and competed against other New Jersey teams. Their father coached them and never missed a day. Their uniforms all said the same thing. The Sarah's. <laughs> Kind of be confusing who's up. They all have the same name. The infields they played on were dirt. Outfields were littered with rocks and sand. The boys loved to talk about the day they played at the old dog track, an oceanfront stadium that had once been an auto raceway. It was there that Anthony, the oldest, hit a couple home runs right into the Atlantic. Ocean. They called Anthony Poser because of the way he'd stand at the flat plate as if his baseball card photo was photo was being taken. Charlie, the fifth oldest, was the slowest brother. He was a good player, but a terrible runner. The brothers often joked about the time he hit a ball nearly out of the park, but only made it to second base. <laughs> Jimmy, the sixth brother, had a knuckleball people still talk about. You couldn't hit it, Eddie said. You couldn't catch it either. The ball danced in the air. Jimmy was a great hitter too, probably the best player on the team. But there was no jealousy, no rivalry, no fighting. As the younger brothers grew up, the older ones shared playing time. If someone dropped a fly ball or struck out, no one screamed or threw down his glove or stomped off the field. We stuck together, said Freddie. The team played around New Jersey, in New York, Connecticut, wherever they could find a good game. All set out letters looking for new teams to play. The All Brothers team always grew big crowds. Well, a good thing if you can draw a big, a big crowd. Make some money for the baseball team. In 1930, at the New York World's Fair, the Sarahs were honored as the biggest family in New Jersey. They were taken to the Newark airport where they boarded a plane and were flown over the fairgrounds. They couldn't believe it. No one they knew had been on a plane before. Most of the people at the World's Fair looking up at that small plane in the sky had no idea there was a whole team of brothers aboard. But it wasn't all fun and games in sunny skies. Their darkest day occurred on the field too. Freddie was on third base in a scoreless game. Alfred was at the plate. He touched his shoulder, the signal that he was going to bunt. Then things went wrong. Pitch came in high and somehow the ball bounced off the bat and hit Alfred hard, right in the face. They rushed him to the doctor, but he lost an eye. For the next few months, Eddie took Alfred's place as catcher. Everyone thought Alfred's baseball days were over. But when you have 11 brothers willing to throw you balls in the yard, gently at first, then a bit harder, you get your skills back. You get your courage back too. Alfred was soon wearing the Sarah's uniform again. He was a pretty good catcher for a guy with one eye, said Freddie. In the 1940s, something pulled the brothers' attention away from the baseball. I guess the 40s? American soldiers were fighting in the Second World War across the Atlantic. That same huge ocean poser had hit his baseballs into. 
battles were raging, soldiers were dying, but the brothers knew it was important to fight for their country. The team disbanded as six uh, Asera brothers joined the service. Jimmy was the first to go. He, Charlie, Eddie, and Bobby all served in the army. After Billy joined the Marines, Freddie did too. Those six brothers traveled far from home. After a lifetime of talking and playing together every day, now they went months, years, without seeing one another. They longed for the salty stew smell of the Atlantic Ocean. They dreamed of their childhood home, of the back door slap, slap, slapping as they ran outside to play and of long afternoons throwing a ball in high, soaring arches from glove to glove to glove in a field full of brothers. Back in New Jersey, their parents and siblings waited for news. It took a long time for letters to reach them from overseas. There was a lot of time to worry. When the war finally ended, everyone was so happy. Eddie, out in California with the army, was so excited that he went up to women he didn't even know and kissed them. Apparently didn't get slapped. <laughs> Many American soldiers died in World War II, but the Sarahs were very lucky. One by one, all six brothers returned from their time in the service. Mama of Sarah cried each time a boy walked in the door. By the summer of 1946, the family was ready to get back to baseball. They were all older course, and Hoser's heart had grown weak, so now he coached the team. They joined the Long Branch City Twilight Baseball League, and over the next six years, won the league championship four times. Every Sunday, crowds filled the stands to watch the all-brother team play. As time passed, the Aceras got married and moved into their own homes. They worked hard at their jobs, at the water company, at the post office, selling insurance. They started having children of their own. Oh my gosh. Huh. 16 kids having kids. Huh. I wonder how many they ended up with. 1952, they played their last game as a team. They had already made history. History? It's true. The Sarah brothers were the longest playing all brother baseball team ever. Nineteen ninety seven, the Baseball Hall of Fame held a special ceremony to honor them. Only seven were still alive. Paul, Alfred, Bobby, Billy, Freddie, Eddie, and Bobby all made the trip, along with more than a hundred relatives, including their sister Frances. Jimmy's son donated his father's uniform and glove, which were put on display right there in the same museum that honored Babe Ruth, Ty Cobb and Willie Mays. They treated us like we were kings, Freddie said. After such a thrilling day, you could picture them driving off into the sunset 
happily ever after. But their bus broke down. They could have sat on the curb grumbling in the summer heat. But someone found a bat and ball, and as three generations of Aceras waited for a new bus, they played ball. What else? That ball soared from grandfather to granddaughter, from father to son, from brother to brother. Wow. <laughs> to have a bus to take your family. Yeah, and here's a picture of them. According to the National Baseball Hall of Fame, from the 1860s into the 1940s, there were 29 baseball teams made up entirely of brothers. The series played longer than any other. They were fortunate to play at a time when there was great interest in hometown teams. Local games were a source of enormous community pride. The story of Long Beach, New Jersey is seldom told without a mention of the Sarah brothers. I came across this story when my husband and Bobby, Sarah's uh, son, Rob, found a much needed recreational baseball league in our town. I learned about the brothers' amazing history and I wanted to tell their story. I discovered that one brother, Freddie, lived near nearby. Nervous about intruding on the stranger's life, I called to ask if I could interview him. Without hesitating, Freddie explained he had an open-door policy for dinner. He cooked for his brother, Eddie, other family members, former co-workers, and any hungry friends there might three nights a week. He suggested I come on Tuesday, plus the night. It was a night of spaghetti with Freddie and Eddie. They recalled some very specific details with sharp accuracy when talking about Alfred's time at bat on that disastrous day Freddie remembered wondering while standing on third why his brother was bunting. Listening to the brothers relive their glory days has been a deeply satisfying treat and a vitally important part of writing this book. Throughout the process the good people in the research library at the Baseball Hall of Fame also of enormous help, especially the director of research, Tim Wiles. An awesome late innings assist from uh, Barry Bellow. What the Sarah brothers achieved is remarkable. But when you meet them, what impresses you most is their strong sense of family and pride. Jimmy's daughter, Pat, said, we all raised, we're all raised to be team players, no matter what situation we were in, at work, at play, at war, in relationships, you carry that spirit with you, and it's part of you. That spirit was inspired in everyone who knew their Sarah's brother. So, uh, hope you enjoyed the story, um, and I hope you enjoyed the story time. To, to me, it was uh, my enjoyable reading those stories. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's not a bad idea to play music next to a zoo. I think it'd be kind of fun watching the animals play instruments personally, even if it's in your imagination or if it's in your dream. Um, again, uh, this is Bonnie Baldwin um, wishing for you and hoping for you a happy and healthy day. And thanks. Um, don't forget tomorrow is Grandma Reads a Story at 3.30. Um, and leave a comment on Facebook, just to let me know that um, you heard the story and that you liked something about it. So um, take care. Goodbye.